Um, so please, will you join me in welcoming Christina Burt, uh, who's a long-time activist and also a professional in the arts, and she's going to be joined by uh, Howard Goodall, Jess Murphy, and John Holloway to talk about the impact in the arts. Over to you guys. Great, thank you so much, and thank you for having us. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, my name's Christina, and I'm hosting the session with our three amazing panelists. Um, I am so delighted to be chairing this because I've worked in, in the arts all my life and um, and over recent years been working in European politics. So this one's really close to my heart. Um, and we're going to be discussing um, the impact of Brexit on the arts. And we're going to be starting to hear um, from our three panellists. They're going to share with us their, their thoughts about this initially. Um, and while you hear them, I really encourage you um, to, uh, to, to put some questions in the chat box. We want to respond to the things that you're really interested in hearing from our panellists about so if they say something that triggers a thought that you would like them to expand on or you have questions for them that you'd like them to discuss and, and and share their thoughts on please put your notes in the chat and we'll include as many as we can um, so I'm going to introduce them now um, we have Jonathan Holloway um, Jonathan um, is a theatre director and writer um, he was the founder of the public events program at the National Theatre and then after that was artistic director of some of the, the world's largest international arts festivals and, um, and now he advises organizations across the globe. Um, and we have Jess, Jess Murphy. Jess is a musician and an actress. Um, and we will know Jess because she did some amazing work in the autumn and we saw the protest outside parliament, Let Music Live, and Jess was the person behind all of that, which was really great. Um, we have Howard Goodall, and we'll all know Howard, of course, because he is Emmy Abafta, Brit award-winning composer, and um, his works include themes to things like Black Adder and all those other amazing big names that we're all so familiar with. Um, in addition, he's written scores for, for film and theatre. So between our three panellists, we cover quite a, a wide um, spectrum across the arts industries. And we're going to start off by hearing from Jonathan um, and uh, hear what he has to say about the impact of uh, Brexit on the arts. Thank you, Christina, uh, and it's great to be joining you all here today. I'm speaking from Spain, where I currently live. Um, I've been a festival director now for a couple of decades, and so I've. Uh, when it comes to Brexit, obviously it was a, an incredible shock. I was in Australia when the whole thing went through, um, and uh, I was running the Perth and then the Melbourne festivals. But I've lived off visa-free movement of artists for my entire career. I've, I've, I've run festivals that have relied on bringing artists from around Europe, from around the world uh, in the easiest possible way. And it's been joyous, it's changed lives, it's been transformational. And the artists we've worked with have collaborated, they've met each other at festivals, they've got together and made new work. There's just this sense that anything is possible. So as a festival director, the impact of Brexit is utterly disastrous. Uh, and in fact, it's immeasurable because uh, we haven't yet seen what's going to happen. The amazing ability to get people from one place to another changes dance, theatre, circus, music, thousands and thousands of careers and millions of lives. Speaking as an artist, it's a difficult time because there is a theory that now we have time to write, we have time to think, we have time to dream. And the truth is, it's an unbelievably demoralizing time for artists and for people who work in the creative industries. They are sensitive people. They tell stories. But also vital is, is the fact that I think nowadays we need to turn to the people who can lobby for us and can tell the story of why we need to end this madness and get absolutely get back into Europe. And the people who need to tell that need to tell it with passion, with smarts, with funny, with humor, with just, it just needs to be told in the most dynamic way possible. And the artists are the people to do it. And in 10 years time, we will watch the films that tell us what happened. But we actually need now the artists to be supported and encouraged and nurtured so that they can be telling the story as it goes along and also lobbying for why we need a change. Speaking thirdly as a European, uh, currently living in Spain. Uh, I mean, my plan was when Brexit happened, I came back to Europe because I'd been away for long enough and I wanted to come in and do what I could to help. So I'm dividing my time between Spain, the US, Australia and the UK. We, obviously now I'm living on Zoom and nowhere else, but that's, that's sort of how it is, but it's deeply, deeply sad. And I spend 
every week talking to artists around the world who can't believe what the UK has done. And the love for the British, the love for uh, the people of the UK, the arts from the UK, the possibilities of going to the UK and coming back from the UK is huge. And and people around the world can't believe that we we shot ourselves in the foot and then shot ourselves in the head. I mean, it's really the most crazy thing to go from a massive ability to travel the world and, and relationships with everywhere in the world to bring it right down to having to renegotiate every new contract, every new relationship. And the reason it was so difficult to bring work to and from Australia is not just the distance. It's the fact that there are so many visa requirements. There are so many practical requirements. And so that's that's been terrible. My fourth and final point uh, to start with is that as a human and a human who's been living in quarantine for uh, almost a year now, I don't think we've got any idea of the impact of uh, Brexit on the arts, on culture, on creativity, because I think it's being masked entirely by the pandemic. And people haven't yet tried to put on a Glastonbury. People haven't yet tried to put on a fully presented lift festival. People haven't tried to bring work to Avignon or take work um, to Holland or to Spain or France. Nobody's tried because we haven't been able to. And so talking to companies in the US, talking to festivals in Iceland, everything has stopped and everybody's tried to deal with this one issue of the pandemic. Um, but I don't think we have any idea yet the impact that's gonna have on arts and creativity. Arts and culture are, um, they are always the people at the forefront of, of the conversation. They are the people who are discussing it. What we need to do now over the next few years, because the other thing is we're not at the end of the play. We're not at the end of the performance. We are part way through and we need to look at what happens now. The second act needs to be about returning to collaborating with Europe. So we need to be doing that. We need to be telling that story fantastically. We need to be making it funny, passionate, engaging. We need to make people realize that it's not just politics that can be either ridiculous, charisma led or wrong. The arts can also be absolutely sensational in telling that story. So that's what we need to do over the next few years. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That's great. And we're gonna hear now from Jess. Um, Jess, if you can tell us it from your perspective. Um, so I guess my perspective is from is that of the freelancer in the creative industries. And I think what perhaps is a bit of a misconception or perhaps isn't properly understood is that the creative industry as a whole, which is worth £111 billion pounds, um, to the economy, which is actually, to put that into perspective, the fisheries contribution is £1.4 billion per year. It's actually the second largest behind financial services. And that economy, that huge amount of money is driven by thousands and thousands and thousands of freelancers. And freelancers work in every single part of um, the creative industries, you know, from a from a lighting engineer who, who works with Beyonce, you know, around the world who happens to be based in England, to a wig maker who works at National Theatre, a puppet, a puppeteer, any a musician like myself. Every single one of those people is a one person business. And they have been out of work for a whole year, every single one of them already. And to now have the situ dire situation we're in compounded by the lack of ability to travel and work in Europe as we have been doing for the past 20 years. And that is the crux of it because basically the creative industries is an intricate, very complicated web of people giving work to each other, working with each other, cultural exchange, financial exchange, and, and also the very important thing of depping, which is simply people filling in for each other at the last minute. If you're a, a if, if it happens in nearly all the creative industries, but to use music as an example, um, it's, it's not just about what we've heard so much in the media that Elton John can't tour or young bands can't tour in Europe, and that's going to be have all the devastating consequences. It's actually about the work that's created in the UK by people going into Europe to work as well. Um, if you're um, a, the first violinist in Hamilton and you get 
uh, booked to go and play so we had to say Elton John on tour or Adele and um, you you will have four or five deputies who will fill in for you and those deputies um, will then maybe normally work on say the Lion King so their deputy will then fill in for them on the Lion King and then that person who works in the Lion King maybe does four days teaching a week which will now go to perhaps a young graduate who is has just qualified and is looking for little bits and bobs to do here and there someone else might have a regular string quartet that they play with just for weddings and events and then now they're playing in the Lion King for a week so that goes to new people that is the kind of that's just a small example of how it all works and the point is is because we've been working with Europe for the past 20 years that web now includes Europe so if you have a situation we're in now where we stopped abruptly last year and then we're going to try hopefully in the next day in the next few months to start up again it's like taking parts out of an engine and then trying to restart it we have absolutely no idea how much this is going to impact even we don't know how much it's going to impact us yet but the government is able to hide behind the fact that none of us are working at all at the moment and that is and it's very easy for them to say, oh, well, actually, you know, freedom of movement, we're not sure about that. And the door is open. But actually, the door is not open. <laughs> At the moment, we have a situation where if you want to try and if you want to try and employ an English musician or an English anything in the creative industries, you basically probably won't if any of the work involves going out of the UK. And we don't have enough work in the UK. We don't have a again just to use music as an example there's not a there's not a small orchestra in every town that we can just join and that'll be fine thank you very much it just isn't like that um we need to be able to travel and they we need to, be able to travel to our audiences in europe and they need to be able to come to us and as it stands there is no way on earth we can actually get through what's happened to us already for, for the pandemic as a result of the pandemic sorry and actually restart this incredibly important just not not just culturally and in all the wonderful ways we've already been talking about but just sheerly in just to the economy it's so important <coughs> let alone everything else so we need a reciprocal travel agreement all sorted out asap <laughs> thank you jess that's great thank you for your perspectives um howard let's come to you now and hear it from you Howard, you're muted. Hello, um, sorry about that. Um, I wonder if you're sitting there thinking, why are we making such a fuss about music? Why have I seen newspaper articles with Elton John in them, et cetera, et cetera? And I'm gonna try and address that if I may. Um, at, to some extent, Jess has covered this, but I, there's another <laughs> aspect of this, which is that the music industry is a canary in the coal mine for all the other service sectors that, it, that our economy is now hugely based upon. We've become over the last 30, 40 years, a basically a service economy, which means people going somewhere to do what they do, whether it's to repair a machine or to take photos or to be a model in another country or to play a musical instrument or any number of huge number of things that are in the services sector, which as Jess said, has been very quiet during the pandemic. But when it restarts, sector after sector, business after business, industry after industry is gonna find that something that used to be very easy is now gonna become very, very difficult, if not unviable, because yes, you can get visas and carnets and cabotage. You can get the, fill in the insurance you need and the special certificates to go to other places and do these things. But they all cost money. And if they cost hundreds and hundreds, which they can do, uh, then this is going to mean that the job isn't worth doing because you won't make a profit on it. And it's quite a simple thing for service industries that either it is viable or it's not. Now, one of the reasons um, industries have sprung up to go to Europe, like ours, the music industry, as our own domestic market of 400 million people is because it's much more expensive and not so viable to go and do the same thing in Thailand or Vietnam or Australia because there are the huge distances concerned and the cost of these doing these things. Now, some businesses do, some musicians do travel that far. Some orchestras, for example, might do a tour in Japan. <coughs> hundreds of thousands of um, sponsorship money to make that possible because it's a terribly expensive thing to do. But it hasn't been very expensive to make our industry work in Europe. And we have been saying, seeing this juggernaut come down the tunnel for uh, three or four years now, I've been trying to warn people that what's affecting us now as musicians is something that will affect, uh, will be affected right the way through the service 
industries. I noticed this week that the, the, the uh, Europe's largest model agency, which is based in the UK, uh, announced that the, their industry, uh, as far as the UK is concerned, is more or less finished because of the new rules on travel and uh, work visas, etc. The fashion industry is worth something like 35 billion a year. It's a huge industry for Britain. And if the main, the main model agency is saying this is completely unviable a model uh, from now on because of this, now they've just woken up to this uh, thing. We've been saying this for a long time. And um, you may also be sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute, uh, you've got the government saying, the prime minister this week saying, we'll sort it out, we'll make sure there'll be some visa arrangements. I'll say two things to this. First of all, this is the same Boris Johnson who said he would sort out the Northern Ireland protocol, which is after just three months on the verge of collapse. He's the same prime minister who says he's going to sort out Brexit with a trade and cooperation deal, which is already killing our export industries. Loads of export industries. Anybody who's seen the figures on food and drink uh, since the 1st of January will know this is an absolutely calamitous situation. And this is going to hit more and more industries as we hopefully open up from the pandemic. So I'm not, I mean, it may be that little fixes can be done. But here, here's my point. There are two issues here. There's the ability to work in another country because you need a visa, a work visa, uh, to do so. So that covers visas and work permits and all those other things, uh, which is expensive and uh, is, a, is a bureaucratic nightmare, but does not Im not impassable as a barrier. But the other part of this is moving goods uh, into and out of the EU and the customs implications of this and the carnets that you need for your equipment and all the other stuff that goes with that, which is extremely expensive. And we, that has happened because we've left the customs union, which, by the way, wasn't on the ballot paper on the 23rd of June 2016. No one said we were also leaving the customs union. We weren't going to stay in the EEA area. We were just going to leave all these. No one said that. They said, we're leaving the EU and we've left the customs union at the same time. And loads of industries right now, including ours, are waking up to the huge expense and difficulty of us having left the customs union at the same time. And I think this is going to seep in more and more into people's consciousness. And the, Jonathan and Jess have said this thing about music being a way of bridging barriers and, and all the rest of it. But it is also something that is um, quite basic to us as a country. It's an important industry for us. And the obvious thing to do is to build your industry in your home market. Our home market has just gone down from 400 million people uh, to just the UK. And uh, right now, Northern Ireland uh, is more or less in the EU, Gibraltar's in the EU, and probably Scotland's going to follow. Uh, we, are, we are making our, wall, our world incredibly small. And while it is possible for big uh, corporations to move around, to move their headquarters to the EU, to move their systems, to use whole departments and pay people to do all this paperwork, and they've got the money to be able to do this and pay these fees, for the small businesses and for freelancers, uh, it's just not viable. And I'm, I'm, we need to have fixes for these things. But just having a creative deal that means you can ad hoc go and play in a tour, do 20 dates across Europe, is one thing. Actually getting a contract to play, say, in the pit of a musical in Germany uh, for four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks is a completely different matter uh, altogether. France and Germany are not offering that. They're not offering contract work. They're just offering ad hoc touring possibilities or the odd concert or the odd visit. So we've got a long way to go, even if some small concessions are now made. I'm sorry that I, I'm, I may sound gloomy about this, but the fact of the matter is it is very, very severe for us. And it is going to be severe for other industries as they discover the complexities we've been trying to warn them about for four years now. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Howard. Um, I would be really keen for, because I'm quite sure that um, that each panellist is going to be wanting to respond to what they've heard the other one say, but I just want at this moment just to put in three questions that we've had from um, delegates who are listening. And I'll, I'll just say them and then I'll invite our, our panellists to respond to each other, but also possibly to respond to any of these. Um, so we have one from Jenny. Jenny's saying, aren't you concerned that the government is minded to censor artistic uh, artistic expression? The second one is from Aaron. What extra barriers will there be for touring musicians? Is it mainly the visas or are there further barriers beyond that? And then Nick says, to what extent will casting directors be looking for actors, musicians, crew that have an EU passport? Is nationality now as important as talent to go on tour to the EU? So those are three sample questions. Um, let's just go round our panel. Um, 
please respond to any of those that you feel inclined to or, or anything that maybe you've heard from the other panelists that um, you'd like to pick up on. Um, Jonathan, should we start with you? Yes, thank you. I was really um, affected by the fact that this is the second largest profession, um, which uh, obviously we also have the second oldest profession, which is exciting. But, um, but the, the truth is it, it's, it's so big and it's so major. Um, but the, the, the fact that the largest profession is the financial services industry, industry and sector, and no one ever came to the UK to visit the banks or to see, look at the banks. They, they come because we have extraordinary art, because we have some of the greatest art in the world. And the choice of people of where they want to be and where they want to live when they can be based anywhere in the world is defined a lot by quality of life. And that's something that we offer. Um, it's also the fact that the question about censorship is interesting. I, I think, uh, yes, I think the fact that the, the the old joke, the difference between a mad dog and an artist is that a mad dog doesn't bite the hand that feeds it, has something to it because there's something about the fact that when freedom of speech does happen and when artists are supported, they are going to be critical of the status quo. But that's just how it is. And that's part of the discussion. It's part of how things should be. So I'd, I think we shouldn't be scared of that. I think people... Uh, satire has never diminished politics. In fact, it's brought people to politics and to understand politics. And the fact that politics now uses the language of satire on a day-to-day -day basis itself is huge. So yes, I think, and then and then um, I, I can let uh, the the uh, the practicing musicians uh, and artists speak about about visas. But it is a lot more than just visa-free access. It's it's absolutely about um, being perceived as being the only person who can do what you do. Now, the truth is, if you're in Warhorse and you were an original com company member of Warhorse and you traveled the world with that show, you were one of the few people who'd created something incredible. Um, nowadays, that, that, that would be very difficult to now get up and running around the world. So on that note, we'll go hand over to Jeff. Jeff, go on, tell us why I'm handing over to you on the Warhorse note. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I wasn't one of the original members, but I was in Warhorse actually for a year in the West End. <laughs> and it was amazing. And I, you know, it was it's a, it's a brilliant example of of just everything that we've been saying about uh, you know something that comes from the, basically the grassroots. Again, the, the original workshop for Warhorse had some incredible creators, and it also had a lot of actors who. You know, I remember Anthony, who was in, still in it when I was in it. Some people ended up in that show for longer than the First World War lasted, <laughs> ran for so long. And some of the original members, you know, there was, they came up with some of the most brilliant ideas that were in Warhorse were just from actors in that first workshop, you know, as well as the brilliant puppetry people and the directors and everybody else. And it, I think um, the, the questions that were asked just then, I think, I, I, yeah, I'm really worried actually about the situation of what the government is thinking about as far as the arts is concerned, really. And I, it strikes me that um, the language that the government is using around the arts is very positive. Um, you know, every every time this issue of work permits has been brought up in the House of Commons, Caroline Dinney has just said, oh, we must foster our arts sort of thing. You know, it's so important to us and la, la, la. But unfortunately, you know, the EU has said no to us saying no, <laughs> you know, basically, um, I, I don't really know where to begin with it, to be honest, because I, I, I fear that, um, that the, the positive language what is being used and things to really quite undermine the arts to not put it, uh, put it mildly, it's happening at the same time. So I, I am quite concerned about where that ends and where it's actually headed. Um, and well, there's a whole other thing, to be honest, but I, let's just say I am very concerned about that. Uh, as far as the EU um, passport permit situation is, it's not just the visas. There's, um, just to take an example out of the air, there's a problem with the haulage, haulage from the UK. It's one of the, the biggest things uh, because if you now, there are loads of companies in England um, which are sort of among the most world-class haulage companies. And if you have, for example, a band from America that comes to tour, often their first stop will be the UK because we've got amazing um, technicians and haulage people and and often musicians as well. And we'll do all the re rehearsals here and then tour from Europe. That's something that's a kind of fairly normal model. 
Anyway, basically, if now, if you, the rule is that you can only have three drop-offs before you have to come back to the UK. So that basically means that's completely out of the window. There's one example. Um, another thing is um, that actually the visas don't exist yet that we need. So as an, for an example, there was a, a guy, um, Sam, his name was, who was a Reese, who'd had some work in Spain before Christmas and it was tied to some work after Christmas. He obviously didn't leave Spain because he wanted to make sure that he was around to do the work. However, when the January came and went, um, he had ended up having to give up the work because the orchestra could not get hold of any paperwork that made it legal for them to employ him. There just isn't there isn't any yet, and I think that's another thing that we're uh, be, is being overlooked. The, the the government is saying, well, you can try to get the visa from every every one of the countries at the moment, but actually that hasn't even been organised in any way. So we actually can't do that yet. I, I've got to shut up, so I'll, I've, I haven't answered the third question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fine. Maybe that, now, now all the onus is on how to do that. <laughs> now, how would you, how okay, would you like so to pick up? The question about is nationality now important because uh, you're not going to be asked to do a job if you ha if you don't have an EU passport. That's already happening right across the fashion industry, across acting and across uh, music. It's already happening. Uh, people are putting out job requests and they're saying you have to have an EU passport. So what Brexit has done, the patriotic government have done, is they have disadvantaged UK citizens more than anybody else in Europe. If you have an, an Irish passport and you're living in the UK, or if you've got settled status and you have a passport from another EU uh, country, for example, you can do many more jobs now suddenly uh, than anybody who's got a UK passport. The UK passport allows you to work just in the UK. It's uniquely disadvantaging to British people, to British musicians and British actors, the rest of it. Uh, and I, and I'm, it's already happening. So, And that's just now coming out of the pand pandemic. Can you imagine how bad that's going to be as the months go by? I'll give you another example of this. A lot of people watching this will know the series Game of Thrones, the most successful uh, program series that uh, HBO have ever made. I think it's the, the biggest uh, hit in, in cable TV history. Um, it was uh, funded by 10 million euros from the U EU Regional Development Fund to be set up and have its base in Northern Ireland, uh, which it did. So the pre-production and some of the shooting was done there. The rest of the shooting was done across the EU so that those units could tra travel with their cast very easily between country to country. Um, and the post-production, a lot of it was done in facilities houses in London. That model now can't work. That work will move elsewhere. We will be the one country that can't be included in those deals. And as anybody who's been at home during the pandemic will know that as a result of Netflix and um, Amazon and all these other new partners coming into TV production, there's been a Europeanization of broadcast. You've seen loads of Scandi Noir and things like this, which are co-funded by European partners uh, to make programs and films. This is a new um, a blooming, a booming uh, industry. And we're not going to be uh, able to take part in that with anything like the ease we have before. It's going to be much harder for us to be involved in that. The friend of mine who produced Game of Thrones for many years um, has now moved uh, his whole organization to Berlin, where he'll make the next big mega series already in plan from there instead, because they within from Berlin, you can now use the same European network that we used to have here. British uh, creative people in all departments are now going to be disadvantaged. We won't, as Jess says, be able to take tours from American bands to come from the UK across uh, the EU like we used to be their base. We used to be their base for all sorts of things. We used to make Hollywood film scores uh, here in London. For also, now, that may be possible, but now that we don't have access to the huge talent base across Europe at short notice, and now that, uh, for example, Alexandre Desplat, who's one of the world's most successful film composers, comes to do his scores in London, uh, if it's going to be more difficult for him to do that, that's a whole tranche of work that simply will go elsewhere. We have been disadvantaged. And I don't just mean we, the small we of musicians or actors or uh, stage designers. I mean, we as a country. Our workforce is now disadvantaged in a way that it should not have been. And this process is already happening. Absolutely. OK, well, that's great. That's going to take us into the, our last closing comments. Um, so I'm now going to uh, read. I've got two other questions, I think, that have come through from the audience, I think, really help us with this. And we, we need to close on time. So we're going to need to ask for really succinct answers, responses from our panelists. You've got less than a minute each, 30 seconds each or something. Um, we're thinking now about how we're going to build back from this. And um, I've got 
these two here, one from Leo. What are the key first steps that the panel would suggest we do to turn the tide, particularly with people outside the creative industries? So we're thinking, you know, within and beyond. And then Tim, is the goal a specific solution for creative industries or is a more general agreement needed to allow UK citizens to more easily work in the EU and vice versa for short periods? So um, respond to those, or if you have something else you think is really important to finish on in terms of where do we go from here, I hand over to you. Jonathan. Oh, you're muted, Jonathan. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, yes, we do need to do something about this. We need to tell our story differently. We need to be more energetic about it. We need to be, um, as creative industries, we need to be lobbying. We need to be working out how come uh, sport opened faster than uh, the arts did in many places in the world. We need to get really good at that. Secondly, we need to make the point that we have probably the best training in the world for dancers, for actors, for musicians, for every form of the arts. Um, and we need to then be training people in our country and then exporting them around the world. Um, and the third point would be about diversity, that, that actually the UK is a, is a world leader at the moment in diverse voices, in communicating and exploring all the different communities and particularly uh, gender, particularly race, particularly um, every, every form of diversity the UK has been pushing hard at. We need to do more, but in the, now we need to be open so that we can be spreading that message and having that conversation around Europe and around the whole world. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. 20 seconds over to you, Jeff. Um, yeah, I would echo the fact that apart from the cultural exchange, it's a huge, incredibly diverse, talented, skilled, creative industry, an amazing workforce from set, set carpenters to concert pianists. And everybody is a small business working at a very highly skilled level and from a range of diverse backgrounds. It's an ambassadorial industry. So all those things, if we can somehow get that across to people and simultaneously get across to the, the home office, <laughs> that this making this being able to travel to work is not an immigration issue. And I think that's the case for all the industries and not just the creative industries. And if we could separate that ideologically, I think that's the only way we're gonna get, we're gonna be able to move forward here because that seems to be the sticking point. So if we can somehow get that across, hopefully we can move forward. Thanks, Jeff. Closing comments, okay. Howard. Uh, two things. First of all, a pragmatic government that actually cared about the people in this country would uh, change the narrative and start us moving back into the customs union because that would save thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs and industries right across the country, not just the creative industries. That would be the first thing they do. I don't think we've got a government that cares about its people, so perhaps that's not going to happen yet. But my positive note is the young will not put up with this. The young... People under 35 simply don't get this agenda. They won't want it. They will take us back into the EU at some point when it's there in charge and not some bunch clique of Etonians sitting in Parliament, sitting on their power uh, and making sure that what they want is what happens rather than what the people want. Uh, because they may say they got a mandate to do this. They didn't. They got a mandate to leave the EU. They didn't get a mandate to leave the customs union. There were lots of things they said and they promised that haven't happened. So my positive note is the young will overturn this because it's in their interest to do. They want a home market of 400 million people. They want 30 countries to be their home, not one little one on an island off the east coast, off the west coast of Europe. Whoa, whoa, I can hear everybody, all the delegates cheering and clapping and absolutely, we're all with you on that one totally, Howard, and that's a brilliant way to end. So yeah, absolutely, 100%. And thank you so much to our panel and I hand back over to the conference.